decided I didn't want to be a PT. And the doctors that I worked with there talked me into going to medical school, which you know I thought was an absurd goal because I, you know, I was a high school dropout. <laughs> Whether you're a shift worker that sort of works night shifts most of your career, chronic insomniac or a chronic taker of Ambien uh, or any sleep drugs, Z drugs or benzos, it, you have about a 14-year shorter life expectancy. So all it does is dissociate your neocortex from the lizard brain, right? And so people were taking this, looking and acting as though they were completely awake, and then they're getting in their cars and driving to casinos and gambling away their life savings, sometimes their house, picking up hookers, going to all-you-can-eat buffets, a primal behavior, right? Lizard brain behavior. All right, welcome. Today we have with us, it's a pleasure to have with us Dr. Kirk Parsley, who's down there in Texas. Kirk, just for those people that aren't familiar with this, share your background. I know you're Navy SEAL, you're a your performance medicine guy, but maybe share a little bit of your background for the people that have yeah, heard so, about you. Um, yeah, so I was I was a SEAL right out of high school. I went to UT, so you might know Katy, Texas, when it was a when it was a small rice farming town that I grew up yeah, in. Yeah, Texas. just west of, just, just west of Houston, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So joined actually at 17, left right after my 18th birthday. Didn't even know what a SEAL was, but I just heard it was like the toughest training in the world. So I wanted to go do that. <laughs> Obviously, as successful in that, made it through the SEAL teams. And then uh, it was pre 9 11. So it's kind of just like a whole lot of a whole lot of training trips, doing a whole lot of the same stuff over and over again. So I decided maybe I'm going to go do something else and thought maybe I'd go to PT school. So I lived in San Diego at the time. So I volunteered at San Diego Sports Medicine. They hired me on as a PT aide. I became a PT assistant, did that all through college. Decided I didn't want to be a PT and the doctors that I worked with there talked me into going to medical school, which I thought was an absurd goal because I, you know, I was a high school dropout <laughs> and I was like, that's a big goal. Anyway, did that. And then when I decided to apply to medical school, pre-internet, you had to go look at the Kaplan review books and figure out what schools you're competitive for. That's when I found out that the military had their own medical school. I had no idea. I figured I'll do that. It's always time. So it's two for one. They tra train you four years of medical school. You got to give them eight years as a doctor. I figured I'd get back to the SEAL teams and get back to the community. And my whole plan was to be an orthopedic surgeon. And I'd done my first year residency and then you, and the Navy, you have to do your first year and then you go out to the fleet as they call it. And then you come back. That's how they keep GPs. And so I figured I'd go back to the SEAL teams, give something back to the community. I got there right when they were building their first sports medicine facility ever. So I got put in charge of that. That's pretty, you know, logical fit. And then we hired all these experts and we had ortho rounds and pain rounds and chiropractors and acupuncturists and PTs and athletic trainers and strength and conditioning coaches and all this stuff. So that was the dumbest guy around. So when you're in the military, when you're the dumbest guy around, they put you in charge, right? And say you're a supervisor. So now I supervise this clinic. So I didn't really have a big role with the SEALs anymore, but the SEALs trusted me. They don't usually trust medical providers because those are the guys who can put them on the bench. And so they started coming to my office kind of one by one and going, hey, man, let me tell you what's really going on with me. And they proceeded to list this you know, litany of symptoms that sounds like metabolic syndrome, prediabetes, and a 55-year-old man. And that's what their labs looked like. And it took me quite a while to figure out they didn't have any diseases. They just weren't performing as well as they'd like to perform. I did everything I could think of, had to completely change the way I think about medicine and look more towards alternative medicine and Eastern medicine and integrated functional, kind of all that world. And you know, stumbled upon one big idea was that they were all, almost all of them were taking Ambien. And I was like, you're about my age. We probably, you probably went to medical school roughly around the same time I did. So like, I didn't know it sleep was. I did. I knew what Ambien was because I took a pharmacology class, but I didn't really know what it did or how, why that would help with sleep. And so once I learned all that, I said, wow, this could really explain like all their labs of every anabolic marker being low, every catabolic marker being high, everything inflammatory oxidative being high. And so I, with the help of the SEALs, we figured out a combination of supplements to get them off of Ambien. And lo and behold, their free testosterone quadrupled and their, you know, total testosterone tripled, their thyroid function came into order, their, you know, cortisol rebalanced, you know, their IGF-1 came back up, like everything kind of rebalanced and they started getting great results. There was a big TBI component in there that I had, that I didn't figure out until right before I left, maybe six months before I left. And that was the residual. I had about an 80% solution for about 80% of the guys. And it just taught me a ton about sleep. And we used to have, pre-deployment and post-deployment before you'd send a team out or when you bring them back, 
we would have guest speakers come in who were influential that people listen to their podcast, whatever. So you have guys like Rob Wolf and John Wellborn and Cresser and Sisson and like that, that all that original kind of paleo <laughs> lunatic fringe health health <laughs> obsessed groups. And so I ended up sharing the stage with those guys and got to know them all really well. And they started inviting me onto their podcast, inviting me to lecture at symposiums and things. And I, by default, became the sleep guy. <laughs> Although I do everything to do with performance. I do sleep, nutrition, exercise, stress mitigation, SARMs, CERMs, hormones, peptides, HBOT, psychedelics, like whatever. So that's kind of me in a nutshell now. It's your, I did orthopedics. I was in the military too. And so I was wondering how the SEALs, because I dealt with some guys, special operators called PJs, our, our version oh, yeah. of the special operators. And they what, just one of my like, best friends did, from high school became a PJ. Yeah. They don't like doctors because you, like you said, we keep them on the sidelines or try to get them back in, in that way. Right. But as far as it is like going through, like when we went to medical school and residency, sleep really wasn't a luxury you had much. I, I, I can remember going two, three days without sleep pretty yep. not infrequently and that certainly as we now know wreaks sort of havoc on our overall metabolic health and health in general i guess with regard to there are a lot of people that take prescription sleep medicines whether it's ambien or lunesta or all these other drugs that are out there are those just generally bad is it, is yeah. it your opinion that no one should be on those things yeah the research on that's super clear the, the one benefit i do have with sleep is that unlike exercise science or nutritional science there's no argument really about about what's right and what's wrong sleep science may be too new for that we haven't had a chance to get controversial but whether you have whether you whether you're a shift worker that sort of works night shifts most of your career chronic insomniac or a chronic taker of ambien or any sleep drugs z drugs or benzos you, you have about a 14 year shorter life expectancy and of course, the shift work is also classified as a type 2A carcinogen. So I don't think it has any, I don't necessarily think it has anything to do with the Z drugs because chronic insomnia and chronic Z drug use both have the same deleterious profiles. So the Z, Z drugs probably aren't doing much for it. But it's like the pharmaceutical industry owns the research when they apply for their approval, right? So they give the FDA what they want to give them. They hold on to what they don't want to give them. And then once they, if they ever get sued, then they have to show it all. So that happened right around the time I was figuring all this out. The makers of Ambien and Lunesta were both being sued because the GABA, like when, of course, there's a couple of things that lead to us sleeping, the blue light going out of our eyes. Everybody knows about that initiation of melatonin. But one of the first uh, effects of melatonin is the release of GABA, right? A, a huge increase in GABA in the brain. What GABA does is it lowers the resting potential of every neuron in your brain, and it makes it harder for the neocortex to fire. So that makes it harder for you to interact with the environment, right? So all your sensory, all your sensory integration and all your motor it's all in the neocortex and all that slows down and makes it harder for that to fire. So all GABA analogs do is they bind to GABA receptor and they have a higher, they have a higher affinity and a higher potential than GABA itself. So benzos affect the receptor about a hundred times as much as GABA and Z drugs affect the receptor about a thousand times as much as GABA. So all it does is dissociate your neocortex from the lizard brain. And so people were taking this looking and acting as though they were completely awake and then they're getting in their cars and driving to casinos and gambling away their life saving sometimes their house picking up hookers going to all you can eat buffets a primal behavior right lizard brain behavior and so once they got sued for all that and then they had to give up all the research it turns out that the ambient the best case scenario for ambient was that it made you fall asleep 37 minutes faster i'm sorry 13 minutes faster and sleep for 37 minutes longer but it decreases REM sleep by 80% and it decreases REM sleep by 20 or decreases REM sleep by 80% and deep sleep by 20%. And if you use alcohol with it, which almost all the seals were, alcohol does exactly the opposite, decreases deep sleep by 80% and REM by 20%. So you do polysomnographs on those guys and they have 99.9% .9 stage two sleep, which is essentially no sleep. So a long way of saying that what the ambient is doing is make you unconscious. It's dissociating your neocortex from your lizard brain brainstem. But it, it does, it's not really inducing sleep. It's inducing a state of unconsciousness. And, yeah. the, and you don't get the benefits of 
being asleep, right? And we can that's go what, through that if you wanted to. Like, yeah, that's what I was going to ask is about the, why, what are we doing? What are we tra- attempting to accomplish when we sleep? And obviously there's a, these different phases, whether it's REM, non-REM, and the various right. one through four or whatever. What do we have to do when we're sleeping to actually get the benefits of that? So the entire purpose of me going to sleep tonight is to repair from today, right? Everything I'm doing right now is catabolic. Like just being awake is being catabolic. Breathing, I, you know, yeah. When I work out, I'm damaging my muscles, right? If we do anything worth doing, when we go to the gym, we come out of the gym weaker than we went into the gym. We get stronger at night. We, so I'm going to I'm gonna repair everything and then I'm going to prepare, meaning I'm going to restock the shelves of all the nutrient densities or whatever, trace elements, whatever I need to do to put around my cells, re- replenishing glycogen stores, all that stuff. So when I first go to sleep, first go to sleep. deep sleep is kind of the first thing that I'm going to go first into as long as I'm circadianly aligned. And so I, I'm going to go to sleep in what we call stage one sleep, which is that's when you're just noticing that things aren't quite the same. You can still hear people, but it's dr- drifting in and out of dream state. And then I go down into two and then three and then four stages, three and four, what we call deep sleep, omega and, uh, or theta and delta wave brain states. And then that travels across time on the X axis. And then I'm going to stair step out of that. I'm going to go from four to three to two past one and back i'm going to do rem and then after i finish rem i'm going to come back down and that's one sleep cycle which is about 90 to 120 minutes the first sleep cycle is about 90 percent deep sleep and deep sleep is the most anabolic time in your life the lowest stress hormones you will ever have so stress hormones are catabolic obviously the lowest stress hormones you will ever have at any 24-hour period is during deep sleep your stress hormones have to be low enough for you to sleep and then the, what's happening there is the neuroregulation of all of your hormones. So all of your anabolic hormones are being measured by the hypothalamus and then pituitary is secreting or not secreting to increase all of your hormones. And that's affecting obviously things like testosterone and growth hormone but and thyroid hormone, but it's also affecting neuroregulation of appetite, ghrelin, leptin sensitivity. And then I'm essentially repairing everything during the same time. One of the first things that happens when I go to sleep is the glial cell, which hold the structure of the brain, they contract by about 30%, allows the CSF to flow through. People call this the glymphatic system, Mm -hmm. and it flushes out waste products. I flush out the waste products, I increase my hormones, the hormones then reset the anabolic rate, increase the anabolic rate, thyroid comes up, that increases anabolic rate, and I'm the most anabolic I'll ever be, and I start repairing things. I start getting rid of waste products and repairing, and then I go into REM sleep, and REM sleep is really more cognitive and emotional. So during REM sleep, you will rehearse everything that you've heard today, everything you've thought today, probably definitely everything you've said. You'll run that through your brain a couple of times and you'll figure out whether you need it or not. And it'll either become a more durable pathway and be attracted, uh, be attached to old information, which is how you learn things, right? You can look at it from multi dimensions if you have, a tr- if you have attachments from old information, um, or it'll be pruned off because you'll this determine it's useless and you'll, you'll actually prune that neuron off. Um, and then you also emotionally categorize your events. So we think this is a big component of PTSD because it tends to be when people go through severe trauma, they tend to sleep poorly. And one of the things that we know happens during REM sleep is the emotional categorization of any event. So if you have a fight with your wife about dirty dishes in the sink or something, that should be a non-issue, right? Like the second that argument's over, it, it, you should probably never think about that again, right? But if you don't sleep well that what, night or if you don't sleep at all that night, you don't emotionally categorize that correctly, that could become a real trigger. And that's a banal example, but that's, that's what we think happens with PTSD and why people are, are more triggered by emotional events that rightfully are emotional, but they're they're hyper emotional, they're you know, exceedingly emotional. And and then each sleep cycle progresses throughout the night, becomes more REM and deep sleep and less deep. So then by the time you get to the morning, it's about 90% REM sleep in your last sleep cycle and 10% deep. So when you miss sleep in the beginning of the night, you tend to miss the anabolic period of your life of that day. And then when you miss, when you wake up super early and skip your REM, then that's cognitive and emotional. And it's worth pointing out that if I could go to sleep tonight, and I could repair 100% and then prepare, so restock the shelves, get all my nutrients in order to rebalance everything. If I could repair and prepare 100%, I would wake up exactly the same every day, right? And I would never age. As we get older, we can't repair 100% and we can't prepare 100%. And so we're waking up at maybe 99.998 or something, and that's aging. 
So when you choose to sleep, everybody's born into the same contract. It takes eight hours to recover from being awake for 16 hours, right? It's a ballpark, right? It's biology. You don't, don't get super technical about that eight hours for 16 hours. If you choose to sleep six hours instead of eight hours, tomorrow still comes at exactly the same time. And you still have to do all the exact same things. So your body compensates by secreting more stress hormones because the whole purpose of stress hormones is to keep you alert in proportion to your environment, right? So people, stress hormones get a bad name. Oh, I don't want any stress hormones. With no stress hormones, you'd be dead. So what you want is appropriate level of stress hormones. Mm -hmm. But if you short sleep or get poor quality of sleep, then you're going to wake up in the morning with excessive stress hormones. And it's quite possible you'll have ex excessive stress hormones the whole day. And then you have a hard time falling asleep because your stress hormones are too high. And then you don't sleep well because you didn't. You had a hard time falling asleep. And now you can't sleep well because your stress hormones are high and your stress hormones keep going higher because you aren't sleeping well. That's the most, ty that's the most common type of insomnia that I work with. What about, you mentioned eight hours versus 16 hours and obviously little kids need more than that because I guess they're growing yeah. and things like that. But as an as adult, are there things that can drive those either direction? Let's say if I exercise a whole bunch, maybe I need more sleep or if I've had a stressful day, maybe yeah. I need more sleep and it might push it out to nine or 10 hours versus and or is there a con converse situation where I didn't do anything? So now I only need seven hours or something like that. Yeah. What but, things impact our overall requirement? Yeah, you're spot on with that. And and it makes logical sense from what I said. If the whole reason I'm sleeping tonight is to repair and prepare, if, if I didn't if I didn't burn much down, if I didn't do much that I need to repair from or restock the shelves from or whatever, like I don't need as much sleep. About and you're right on, about seven hours, seven hours and fifteen minutes, somewhere around there is like the minimum effective dose of sleep for 99.9% .9 of the population. But you're right. If I went out and ran an ultra marathon, assuming I could, I don't think I could, but if I ran out, if I went out and ran a marathon, let's say that, if I ran a marathon today, I'd probably need like 12 hours of sleep tonight. So if you're really overtaxing yourself, and that can be cognitive, that can be emotional, that can be physical, but anything that's like really ramping up your stress hormones and really depleting your stores and inflaming you, especially the most powerful anti-inflammatory we have in our body is testosterone. And the peak testosterone production, well, 98% of all the testosterone you produce in 24 hours is during deep sleep, right? And so that's when you're really repairing. So if you're going to, if you're going to be anabolic, the more catabolic you were during the day, the more time you need for the anabolic behavior. How does nutrition, either the composition or the timing of nutrition impact sleep? Or do we have any good data on that? I've seen some studies on like carbs before bedtime and different things. Do you under understand much about that? The correlation the other way is actually more powerful. As far as your macros, when you're eating your macros, that's, that's really, no. it'll be no surprise to you. That's really dependent upon your metabolic state to begin with, right? If you have insulin sensitivity issues, right? If you're somebody who has a fasting insulin of 45 or something like that, uh, eating carbs before bed is going to be really bad for you because if you eat carbs close to bedtime, uh, like I'm, I'm sure you've probably seen clinically that people who are pre-diabetic pre -peri -diabetic or even diabe diabetics who don't control their blood glucose well, they don't sleep very well. And that's because your brain will wake you up with a rapid decrease in blood glucose. And it doesn't matter what it's going from. It could be going from 400 to 300, right? still ridiculously high, but that sudden decrease will trigger your brain. And the theory behind that is that it's probably like every other mammal on the planet, right? The only time any mammal on the planet sleep deprives themselves is if they're starving to death or if they're being, if they're being preyed upon, right? If they're being stalked. So it's reasonable to believe that we probably have some evolutionary trigger in our brain that says, hey, blood glucose is going down really quickly. We're either in a really stressful state where we're like, just like we're just we've dumped all of our glycogen and now that's crashing or we're being like we're, we're starving to death so that will cause an animal to wake up earlier faster and it does the same to humans so it, it leads to an adrenal response when you get this quick dip in blood glucose so if you have insulin sensitivity issues and you eat carbs in your bed there's a good chance you drop fast enough and, and like i said the total 
doesn't match just the rate of decline. Now, what's more impressive though, is the fuel partitioning the next day, right? So if you don't sleep well and you're catabolic, your stress hormones are really high, right? And cortisol, of course, is increasing the breakdown of glycogen to, you know, to, uh, so it's, it's favoring not storing glucose, right? And so you're, you're favoring storage of fat and not storing glucose. So what you, your fuel partitioning changes, you can have the same macros, but then, like I said earlier, also the leptin and ghrelin sensitivity to the brain is a, is readjusted every night. So every night that you don't get good sleep, you could wake up the next day with not only bad, unfavorable fuel partitioning, but also a higher appetite, right? And a higher craving because of the combination of those two, a higher craving for fats and glucose, right? If I'm starving to death, my brain... If I'm going into famine, my brain wants glucose, and then my body wants to store as much fat as I possibly can because maybe I'm going into famine. And so I'm going to crave sugar, and I'm going to crave fat, and I think that's where the donut comes from, right? It's like we're going to fry up some sugar bread and get lots of fat in there and so forth. Yet the correlation goes the correlation goes both ways. And, and the same is true for sleep and everything else, sleep and exercise and sleep and stress mitigation throughout, through, throughout the day. Everything's negatively impacted by sleep and then poor lifestyle or lack of sleep, I should say. And then poor lifestyle choices impact your ability to sleep. How does the circadian light light type of play into this? I know there's some thought that looking at red night at light at night triggers melatonin response. How important is it to maybe eat or exercise within daylight hours versus nighttime eating and exercise? Does that have a role? Yeah. So, it, it turns out the most important aspect of the benefits of sleep, obviously we need quality and quantity. The quality seems to be most affected by timing. So the more you're aligned with your circadian rhythm and the more consistent you are, which makes sense because you can't just shift your circadian rhythm by three or four hours in a day or something. It doesn't work like that. You can only move it about half an hour to an hour per day. So the, the can you ask your question again? I got caught up. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna ask you how the fact oh. that we we live in this day night yeah, cycle yeah, yeah. and, and yeah, when yeah. we exercise, I, when we eat. I got yeah. So our ancestors are obviously our ancestors evolved without artificial light, evolved without HVAC and so forth, and we're aligned to be on this planet. Of course, that we evolved on. That's my pitch on everything. When the science gets controversial, I'm like, how do we evolve? Like, what, what were people doing two thousand years ago? That's probably the right way. So our, our ancestors, the only light they truly had was the sunlight and a little bit of fire, right? At, at nighttime could be light. And so we have some ganglia in the back of our eyes that have nothing to do with vision. They just sense blue light. So that's why a lot of blind people can have normal circadian rhythms for this reason. And once the blue light goes down, as you said, that triggers through this circuitous pathway going through the SCN and the, then the pineal gland secretes melatonin. Melatonin secretes GABA, like I was saying, the GABA then or causes GABA increase and then GABA uh, slows down the neocortex. And the that leads to a whole cascade that takes two to three hours to work before we really feel sleepy. But the things that happen with the circadian alignment is the secretion of melatonin in a predictable schedule, the secretion of GABA in a predictable set schedule, the timing of the neocortex slowing down. And then our body temperature drops because we didn't have HVAC, right? The secretion of GABA, like I said, le leads to the slowing down of the neocortex. If you can't excite yourself past that, right? If you've ever been so tired, you wake up in the morning, I'm just going to go to work and come home and go to sleep. And then your friend talks you into going to happy hour, you're drinking some CNS depressants, and all of a sudden you're, you're stimulated and you're wide awake, right? Because you've just overcome that GABA effect anyway. So the circadian alignment is super important because people think that when we shift our circadian rhythm, we're, sh we're shifting all the circadian uh, rhythm of all of our cells. That's not true. So every cell has a biological clock, right? Every cell has a circadian rhythm. It's doing different things at night. It's doing different things at sleep time. It's doing during wake time. And so we can entrain ourselves to go to sleep in alignment with the rest of our cells, or we go, we get, we work night shift and we keep our brains awake when our cells are saying, no, we're doing sleep stuff. And I think that's where that mismatch is what causes the damage and the shortened life expectancy and all that. So the circadian rhythm is one important part to make us go to sleep. That, of course, if you're aligning with the sun, that's going to be very consistent. So consistency matters a whole lot with that. It, it, the, the other thing that matters a lot is 
uh, what we call sleep pressure. And that's just adenosine, right? So ATP to a, ADP, AMP, and just A. And that A is like telling our brains, hey, man, we've burned it down. Like it's time to go to sleep. Like we, we need to rest. So men tend to be more muscular than women. Men build up sleep pressure a lot better than women. Men usually go to sleep even when they're stressed out. They crash. They do a sleep. They do one sleep cycle and then they wake up because their stress hormones are high. But the we need the adenosine for the sleep pressure. That's one thing that's driving us to sleep. And then the circadian alignment is the other thing that's, that's driving us to sleep. And then the sleep environment, of course, is allowing us to maintain sleep. Yeah, because you mentioned, obviously, back before we had heating and air conditioning, it got cold at night and it was warm in the day. And I, my understanding is body temperature dropping triggers sleep and there's an optimal temperature range. Maybe you could discuss it because I know there's always fights between men and women about how cold they want the bedroom and what, what, right. what science say is the best sleeping temperature. The, the, the primary difference there is is body mass. And so the women are just cooling off faster than men. The core temperature going down about one degree Celsius. So about whatever, roughly two degrees Fahrenheit. That That's a pretty big drop in core temperature. If you've ever, like when I was a SEAL and we dove in cold water a lot, they were always, they're super worried about a, a core temperature that went down three degrees. That was hypo, that was hypothermia and you could affect your, so it, it's actually a pretty big decrease. And what they found research-wise is it's somewhere around 64 degrees Fahrenheit that people tend to sleep well. Of course, that can vary depending on like how spongy your mattress is because that holds heat in, how many covers you have on you and things like that. But that seems to be 64, 66 degrees seems to be the sweet zone in the research. How do we deal with, I guess let's get into, obviously we talked about uh, and some of these other pharmaceutical drugs that don't really provide sleep. They just give you an unco- you said unconscious type of state. What things actually work? I know you have a sleep product that, that you know, obviously looked at this quite intensively. What things actually work? I know melatonin was very popular for a period of time, and then it's fallen out of favor to some degree. But what what actually works? And then I guess maybe also talk about, if you don't mind, like travel. Like when we go, like when yeah. you fly time zone, now you're all screwed up. How do you deal with that and, and what things actually work? Okay, so there are, undoubtedly, there are probably herbs and roots and flowers and things that help with sleep. I, I don't have any expertise in that. So I'll, I'll leave that to those people who are whatever that education pipeline is. Um, when I decided to try to get the seals off of Ambien, of course, I couldn't just say, suck it up, buttercup, like just sleep. They're taking Ambien because they couldn't sleep, obviously. So I went to like really con- conventional conservative databases, like Cochrane database, mm-hmm. right? And whatever, Google Scholar and this... PubMed and things like that. And I just looked up what supplements have been proven to affect sleep. And then once you learn enough about sleep, you go, okay, there's actually nothing surprising about that, right? So like I said, you have the you have that initial trigger of melatonin, which is like the starter pistol that starts this cascade of hundreds of neurotransmitter changes throughout your brain, throughout different regions of your brain, throughout the night, everything's cycling around. So it's a really complex mess what all melatonin changes. But like I said, One of the first First changes is this big increase in GABA slowing down the neocortex, right? And so all I like all I put in my supplement, which is what was proven to work by the databases, right? It was like everything that helps you produce melatonin, right? So tryptophan becomes five hydroxy tryptophan. Mm -hmm. You need magnesium and vitamin D three as cofactors to turn five five HTP into serotonin. Serotonin becomes melatonin. Then we needed GABA. GABA doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier super well, so you take L-theanine, which enhances the efficacy of GABA, what does cross into the brain. And that was pretty much it. Later on, I figured out, you've probably seen the research for like lactate threshold and VO2 max and so forth, that phosphatidylserine can enhance that because it lowers cortisol and norepinephrine, stress hormones. So cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine. And so I added that because so many people have sleep problems. A lot of people... Research will, sh- will show that people will have a higher, have an increased subjective or subjective increase in sleep quality and duration when they use THC. However, tachyphylaxis is super quick with that. So you, you end up on about 10 times as much THC, THC in 30 days than what you started with. Uh, but objectively, if you do a polysomnograph on them, the, their quality of sleep goes down si- significantly. The CBDs, do actually seem to be somewhat promising and that they can both enhance 
uh, duration and quality, and they don't, and you don't seem to accommodate to them nearly as quickly. So you can, and I think one's called CBD two. I don't know a whole lot about those, but it's called a CBD two, which or CBD CBD two and CBDN. I don't know what the N stands for, honestly, but those have both been shown shown to improve both subjective and objective quality of sleep. But it's not huge. It's ten percent, twenty percent, something along those lines, and then. As far as the things that you can do to improve your ability to go to sleep, we talked touched on earlier, and actually you asked earlier, and I forgot to say, part of that consistency of going to sleep at the same time to get the highest quality is also dependent upon the activities that you're doing during the day being somewhat consistent. If I work out right before bed, if I work out two hours before bed and I just really go in there and hit it hard, I'm, gonna, I'm spiking my stress hormones hugely mm-hmm. to get to that workout. I'm going to have a harder time going to sleep versus... And that's actually, to answer your question, that's actually one of the tools we can use for jet lag. If I'm going somewhere where bedtime is going to come before I want it to come, I can work out late in the day. I can put bright lights in my eyes late in the day, and I can actually stimulate my adrenals to raise my stress hormones to push my bedtime further away from me. And like I said, you can do about half an hour to an hour a day. If you're going across six time zones for two days, you're going to be screwed up the whole time. In fact, you're probably better just staying on your other time zone, your home time zone if you can, because you can only adjust about one time zone a day and that's at best. But you adjust it by, if I put bright lights and exercise early in my day, I bring bedtime closer. If I do it later in the day, I push bedtime away from me. And that's real. those are really the only two things we have. With regard to the sub, the L-theanine and the magnesium, vitamin D and so on and so forth, how, because you said that it's all in an effort to maximize production of melatonin, which we make endogenously, right. but to, to supplement that, is there a time frame? It's got to take some time. It doesn't just happen instantaneously. So by the time you take it, however you take it orally, yeah. sublingually, what's the time frame that, that needs to occur? Yeah. I think ideally you would be, ideally you'd probably be looking at close to two hours before bed. If you're dealing with a capsule, I have mine in both like I put mine in, in both capsule and liquid form for that reason. The liquid absorbs a lot faster. Like I said, it, it takes about three hours for the for your brain to feel like sleeping afterly, right? So if you go camping and you don't use lights or something, you'll notice that about three hours after bedtime is two and a half to three hours is about when people start feeling really sleepy. So it takes a while to change all that. I'm What I'm trying to do is say... Obviously, there's the ideal way to live life, and then there's reality, right? You have to supplement and mitigate in that gap to try to bring those two closer together. So I really push, like I, I really push on mine. My the concept of mine, which would be impossible to prove unless I sample people's brains. My, the concept of mine is that we're going to concentrate everything that would ordinarily be concentrating during that period of time. We want to give you a super light dusting of melatonin because I want you to produce melatonin throughout the whole night, right? Because I want your brain to do it, to keep it going. As you mentioned earlier, people take melatonin supplements from the time the sun goes down until this time the sun comes up, you're only producing about six micrograms of melatonin. And so even if you take a one milligram tablet and you're take you're getting all of that at once, it's like you're it's super physiologic and you stop down, you start down regulating receptors to it. And you probably downregulate melatonin production, but we haven't proven that for sure. For my liquid, I tell people 30, an hour, 30 minutes to an hour before bedtime, and then the capsules an hour to two hours before bedtime. And that's more based on customers and reports. And the SEALs actually helped me figure out the dose, dosing of all of this by just being great patients that, that journaled and came and checked in with me every day and gave me great feedback. And that's, I guess, anecdotal or clinical experience. Let me ask you about, you kind of touched on this beginning with a life expectancy, but there, when we look at poor sleep or p- poor sleep volume or quality over a period time, of time, it probably affects probably. just about every disease, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, dementia, I would imagine. Is that fair to say that poor sleep is correlated with about everything bad? Every single disease and all cause morbidity, all colors and mortality significantly increased. In fact, like, like I was alluded to earlier, the World Health Organization classified 20 years ago, classified shift work as a type 2A carcinogen, which is the same thing as cigarettes, which means basically 
we're really sure it causes cancer, it'd just be unethical to test it. it. It's about as bad as it can get. Insulin sensitivity changes by about 30% in multiple tissues in your day with a single night of short sleep, right? Inflammation, like inflammation, I've seen inflammation 300% difference between a good night's sleep and a bad night's sleep if you're measuring like HSCRP or interleukins for marking inflammation or things like that. And so it, it literally is every single disease you can think of, you're at an increased risk. One of the reasons almost certainly is because of testosterone. It drives testosterone down so badly to when you chronically sleep poorly, you're going to be in like the lowest 10 to 30% of the normal bell curve if you stay inside the normal bell curve. And, and there, of course, there's all sorts of anabolic benefits and anti-inflammatory benefits of testosterone. And what we show, what we showed in the SEAL teams were the first ones to ever document this, which, but I think plenty of people knew it, just nobody documented it, that Total testosterone is almost a one-to-one -one correlation. It's a 0.87 correlation but between time in bed, time of bed asleep, and, and total testosterone. So it works both ways. We can increase your testosterone, we'll increase your sleep. Increase your sleep, we'll increase your testosterone. So, yeah, th there's lots of the factors as far as disease. But the most surprising thing that most people don't know is things like injury risk. When they adjusted school times by 45 minutes in pri five private schools, they decrease the risk of injury significantly. They look at high school high school athletes and the amount they sleep. Like every hour that you decrease the amount of sleep you get, it essentially doubles your injury risk. A lot of people don't know this. This is this one was surprising to me. If you're looking at the 16 to 24 hour, 16 to 24 year old age bracket, you're a kid in that range is three times more likely to die from a drowsy driving accident mm -hmm. than they are from an alcohol related accident. And, to, and it just goes on and on. Like every, the Exxon Valdez was sleep deprivation. That Almost every plane crash, sleep deprivation is a, either the, the primary or one of the, one of the top attributed causes for that. Yeah. yeah, so it's devastating. And we sleep deprive our kids more than we sleep deprive ourselves. Because like you said earlier, kids need far more sleep than us, uh, especially when they're going through puberty, right? So when kids are going through puberty, they need about 12 hours of sleep, but yet we have them because of public schools, we have them getting up at six o'clock in the morning or something. They have a phase shift when they go into adolescence and they don't feel like sleeping for about two or three hours later than they ordinarily do. And now we have them waking up at six in the morning. Looks like we lost connection for a second. Hopefully he'll pop oh, we did. back in. So okay. there we go. That's Kirk, we lost, sorry, we lost you for a second. Yeah. You were just, I think the last thing I heard you were discussing about the high school kids and, and the improvement in injury rates and so on and so forth and death rates with car car accidents and stuff like that but hey let me ask you uh, a question about um we'd mentioned kids need more sleep that's pretty well documented a lot of older people they just don't seem to get as much i can remember my grandparents they seem like they only slept four hours and yeah that's not something that we need less sleep as we get older it's just maybe our sleep our ability to sleep is poor do we still need eight hours of sleep when we're 70 and so on and so forth yeah, yeah, we still need the same amount of sleep. And unfortunately, it is true the pineal gland calcifies over the course of our lives and bec probably becomes less efficient at secreting melatonin. But also, I think a lot of it has to do with inflammation. A lot of it has to do with insulin sensitivity. And I have had several patients in their 70s and 80s who say they haven't slept more than four hours in 20 or 30 years. And I work with them, get their sleep hygiene in order, get their get them metabolically, physiologically healthy, get them doing a little bit of exercise. And I have plenty of people sleep eight hours again. But there's a couple of things that tend to wake us up. One, we've talked about a lot already, stress hormones. Elderly people don't tend to have those because the stress in their life is pretty much taking, yeah, it's all gone at that point. Uh, they've gotten past all the, the rough stuff. But the other things that will wake you up is having to move around in your bed a lot, right? So if you have a lot of osteoarthritis, if you have a lot of joint limitations, you have uh, flexibility limitations, if you have, that's one reason that's like joint pain stresses on your joints that will cause you to move around. Lack of blood supply. So if you lay on a really soft mattress, you tend to sag, it hurts your joints. If you lay on a really hard mattress, you can press your blood supply and older people weaker, smaller hearts, whatever, and they have a harder time maintaining blood supply. And when that blood supply gets cut off for enough time, your body starts responding to that like a threat immune system, like an ice bath or a heat pack or something would do to you. And so then you have to move to get the circulation going back around. And then another thing is that elderly people tend to be 
uh, have lower cold tolerance, and I, that's primarily hormonal. There's some body comp issues as well, but if you maintain enough muscle mass, it doesn't seem to happen nearly as much, obviously. But the other reason that you will, the other reason that you'll move around in your bed is if you're getting hot. So if you start measuring heat, you start not moving enough, and the mattress is formed up around you, holding in heat. It starts getting you a little too warm, and you and you'll move to do that. So all three of those things tend to be worse and elderly. There's also there's also a social programming aspect to it, right? We're rewarded for not sleeping a whole lot and working really hard. And older generations than us were even more rewarded and harder working and so forth. And so it, it's a common psychology uh, shift that needs to go on. And to be a 100% frank, the elderly people I work with very rarely sleep eight hours with great quality as consistently as younger people do. But we can get them in within the Pareto distribution, like 80% of the time they're getting a good night's sleep. And I've yet to find anybody that's just like too old to sleep. Yeah. So it, it can be reversed, but it just takes some attention and a little bit of CBT to change the way they think about it. What you, you'd mentioned, obviously there's reality and, and optimal. Maybe you could describe, not everybody's going to do this, but at least some of these things we can do, like optimal practices to get good sleep to, to set us up, like meal numbers, timing, exercise, not obviously avoiding alcohol, things like that. What are the things that are probably very important when it comes to getting good night's sleep outside of the supplements, which are a different issue, I think? Yeah. So what, what we call sleep hygiene or sleep ritualization, you can go online and you can look up a million million people have their own opinions on uh, what that is. I'll, I'll dispel the, the mysticism a little bit and say that all, all sleep hygiene is one of those three things that we talked about, right? Decrease in blue light, decrease in activity in your brain. Like I said, you can overcome the GABA effect. If you, like you can watch television to distract yourself, but if you're wet, watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Silence of the Lambs or something like, you're probably going to stimulate some stress hormones and it's not going to work out well for you now. So decrease the blue light, decrease the activity, and then decrease your body temperature. You think about it like if you ever had kids or you ever been a little kid, you'll remember there's this protracted bedtime routine, right? You don't take a five-year-old kid who's banging trucks together and just throw him in his bed and turn off the light and walk out of the door. That won't, that will never work. 100% failure. So what do you do? You say, we're going to dim the lights down. We're going to slow down the activities, go play with your puzzles instead of this. And then we're going to give them a bath. Why? We're going to lower their body temperature with a bath because nobody takes a 99 degree bath. Everybody's going to take an 80 something degree bath, going to lower their body temperature. Then you're going to put them on Put on their onesies and powder them up so less sensi- less sensation of skin, right? You want to decrease sensory input. And then you put them in a bed. You make them feel super safe. You sit down. You read them a book. You, read them a, you don't read them a book they've never heard before. You read them a book that they know, that they have memorized because you're just trying to distract their thoughts. This is exactly the same thing adult. You don't need the onesies and the baby powder. <laughs> but we need the same type of thing as an adult. Like We just think, oh, we don't need that anymore. So you can do everything right. You can block the blue light. You can drop you can drop your temperature down. You can have a comfortable bed, comfortable sleeping environment with an ideal mattress, an ideal temperature, your pre-bedtime alarm clock, your AM work alarm clock, like everything worked out. But if you work on your computer till 9.59 and get in bed at 10 o'clock and think you're going to sleep, like that's, not, no, that, that's not how the world works, right? So you have to slow down the brain, decrease the temperature, decrease the blue light. If you have if, if there's any chance you have uh, sensitivities to poor insulin sensitivity or failing, whatever, uh, worsening insulin sensitivity, non-ideal, we'll say, uh, probably avoid carbohydrates close to bedtime. You don't want to go to bed with a full stomach. So hour and a half to two hours before bedtime should be enough to empty your stomach. A really big meal will just cause some sensory issues by themselves, just gastric distension, the amount of motility that needs to happen in your gut and all that. You know, just, I guess, sort of common sense things around nutrition. Then, of course, like I said, exercise, anything that could induce physiologic or emotional or psychological stress, you want to keep that as far away from bedtime as you can. Again, there's ideal, there's reality. Some people have to work out at 6 p.m. like that's the only time they have. All right, that's that's what we're going to do. We Still be consistent. The consistency is really a super important thing. If you... I, I tell people set an alarm clock like an hour before bedtime and take that just as seriously as that alarm clock that wakes you up in the morning. Like those are like neither one of those are negotiable and you're going to adjust that for the time in bed you have. And you don't do anything but sleep or meditate during that time in bed. So 
decrease the blue light when that alarm clock goes off. You can put on blue blocking gla glasses. You can dim lights in your house. You can your computers have F lux. Like there's your phones have programs. Everything now has a program to get blue light out. Turn the air conditioner down or go take. Don't take a cold like freezing shower because that'll that's a stress response. You know, to, don't do an ice bath, but do. Like you can take a cool, a cooler shower or bath or something like that, lower your body temperature a little bit. And like I said, slow down the neurocognitive input. Um, have that bedtime alarm that says, Hey, it's time to get ready for bed. Then you get into bed. You never look at the alarm. You never look at the clock again until the alarm clock in the morning goes off because it doesn't matter, right? The, the most important time of your day getting ready for your list, like your things to do, everything that's important to you you want to do when you're at your peak, right? You want to be as capable as possible to handle your list. So you go to bed an hour after that bedtime readiness goes off. You get into bed, you never look at the clock again. Even if you don't think you need a morning alarm clock, you have a morning alarm clock so that there's no chance of worrying about not waking up to your alarm clock or oversleeping to not having an alarm clock. And I recommend having a to-do list. Actually, I work. I recommend a a to worry and a to do list. So the to do list is as far as you're likely to stress, right? For me, that's a day. I look at my calendar when I wake up in the morning and that, that's all I need. Some people think about everything on their to do list for six months. So whoever you are, a to do list, the to worry list are things you don't have any control over, but you're going to worry about them. I mean, and, and anything that's going to eat up cognitive processing, we want it to be on that list with the idea of once you go to bed, if any of that pops in your head, you say, I don't need to deal with that. I'm going to deal with that in the morning because the most capable I will ever be at handling that list is after I've gotten a good night's sleep. And if you wake up in the middle of the night, and you need to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. Don't look at the clock. You look at the clock. You start doing mental math. You start waking yourself up. If you go to the bathroom, come back and get in bed. And then it doesn't matter what time it is. Even if you're somebody who has insomnia, say, here's the one place I'll differ from the majority of sleep science. Don't go in your living room and read a book. Don't go in your living room and watch television. Get back in bed. Meditate. Meditation can be, that can be transcendental. That could be prayers. That could be breath work. That could be progressive muscle relaxation, whatever. Like just some sort of meditative practice. And you say, from the time I get in bed to the time I, my alarm clock goes off, I'm only going to sleep and meditate. And if you wake up and you don't know what time it is and you get back in bed and you meditate and your alarm clock's not going to go off for four hours, you're going to fall back asleep. And I don't care when it is because the next best thing you can be doing to sleeping is meditating. So you meditate as long as you need to. If you wake up and your alarm clock's going to go up in 20 minutes, all right, you got seven hours and 40 minutes to sleep and 20 minutes of meditation and get up and go, right? We actually have a, I don't know if my team gave you to, gave this to you. We could, we could offer it to your audience. It's a download from, my website, it's a kind of a little workbook that explains this process right here, how to get stress out of your sleep. That's the most important part in modern society is getting people to lower their stress hormones while they're sleeping. Kirk, we just have a couple of minutes left. I don't know, one thing, one question, obviously I want you to share your website so people can find more information from you and if they want to use some of the products that you have. But let me ask you about specifically to the supplements that people may have, because you mentioned with melatonin, sometimes we become, we downregulate our sensitivity to this stuff. Are supplements like yours, are these kind of PRN things that you would take maybe when you're traveling for jet lag or when you're not having sleep, it just helps you get back into that rhythm? Or how do you recommend that and then share your website and whatnot? If, if you think your nutritional status is like spot on, you're really consistent, you get great sleep, yeah, take it episodically when it makes sense for you. I find the vast majority of people aren't in that situation. A quick story, Rob, you know, Rob Wolf, he's an investor in the company as well. It's me, Robert, me, Rob Wolf, and Peter Tia launched this. And Rob comes over to my house. We're doing a, a lecture together the next day. And he's like, hey, you're going to take a sleep remedy. It's called Sleep Cocktail back in the day, which was a terrible marketing name because I'm a doctor, not a marketer. And, and I was like, ironically, I ran out. <laughs> like I run the company. I don't have any. He goes, I got one more pack. And he, uh, he's like, are you sure? And I'm like, all right, I'll take it. And then I wake up the next day and I'm like, oh my God, what was I thinking? I always sleep better on this. But I, I so that. I'd say the vast majority of people who take it say that they sleep better all the time. And I'm not trying to push mine specifically, like anything that kind of idealizes your nutritional milieu when you're sleeping. But yeah, definitely episodically, if you're going to travel, I would try to try to plan it to where you're trying to encourage your bedtime to be closer to where you're going than where it is. And so two or three days before you go, 
then while you're there, maybe a couple of days when you get back to realign everything. And it, you know, if you're into kind of daily supplements, then whatever. I take 40 pills a day. So it's just one more thing for me to do, but yeah, it, it's good. And my website is just DOC start short for doctor, obviously, uh, the military, everybody's a doc, whether you right, yeah. have eight weeks of training or 18 years of training, you're a doc, right? Same guy. So doc, and then my last name, Parsley, like the Arab. So docparsley.com. That's got whatever, all my media appearances, lectures, TED Talks, whatever, that kind of stuff, podcasts, blogs, and then my supplement, my book, my ebook, all that stuff's on there. Dr. Parsley, thank you so much for sharing this. Got to go. I think 